everyone sticking around and um, participating in this side session for the event. I know it's a, at the end of the day for people who are attending in person um, and some of you have, may have been waiting online a while too. Um, so I really appreciate you sticking in there. So our session today is about unpacking the determinants of anemia and adjusting for inflammation. And my name is Megan Barasa, and I'm the program lead for the Micronutrient Data Innovation Alliance, or DINA for short. And DINA is really focused on improving the accessibility, availability, and use of micronutrient data so that it can be better used in national decision making. And one of the ways that we're doing that is to bring together different groups of stakeholders and supporting capacity development. So this session is a nice example of that in a collaboration with uh, Brenda and UC Davis and some of the other forum work outside of DINA as well. Um, so we'll be uh, reviewing that. And if we could go to the next slide. And so I'm joined here today by several collaborators. The first being Sonia Hess, who is a research nutritionist at the Institute for Global Nutrition at UC Davis. She's also a senior research associate with the Micronutrient Forum. And Melissa Young, uh, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Global Health at Emory University. And Han Shi Lo, who is a research assistant professor uh, also in the Global Health Department at Emory University. And finally, with Yian Ko, who is a research assistant professor in the Department of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics at Emory University. And just for the next slide, um, we will be going over the um, multifactorial causes of anemia, which Sonia will present first, and um, then we'll learn about the adjustment for inflammation and a new um, shiny app that's been developed by the Brenda team. And then to learn the ways to assess the attributable fraction of anemia within a population. And then each of these presentations will be about 15 minutes. If we have time, we'll take questions immediately after, but we've saved about 15 minutes at the end for a Q&A. So as you think of questions, feel free to write them in the chat and then I'll um, share them with the, the speakers when we get to that Q&A session. I'll also be putting in the chat box some links to publications and other resources that you might find helpful um, as each of the presenters is um, uh, going through their presentations as well. So I will pass it over now to, to Sonia to um, talk about some of the causes of anemia. Yes, thank you, Megan, and thank you, everybody, uh, the organizers, for uh, having this side session. Um, I'm going to review the causes and risk factors and related data needs um, to accelerate action to reduce anemia. This was uh, done as an input paper in the context of the comprehensive framework for integrated action on the prevention, diagnosis, and management of anemia, which is being led by the World Health Organization. The paper that I'm reviewing here is a review paper, and that's 104. The other three are coming out soon, and the current paper um, has been published. So the, Megan will send the link to that paper in the chat if you're interested. So the objective both of the paper as well as the um, presentation today is to provide a brief summary on the etiology of anemia, major data gaps and ways forward in knowledge on the determinants of anemia and related data needs. Anemia, as you, uh, I'm sure you know, is a consequence of a wide range of causes and biological, socioeconomic and ecological risk factors. And these are very context specific and often act concurrently. There are three main underlying physio physiological me mechanisms of anemia. One is ineffective erythropoiesis, so the body doesn't produce adequate numbers of, erythro of erythrocytes. Then hemolysis, where the erythrocytes are destroyed, and then there's blood loss. And the various causes can lead to various um, combination of these uh, mechanisms. One of the major causes of anemia, but certainly not the only one, is iron deficiency. Iron deficiency is, is estimated to be a, about um, attributable, attributable about 60% of the anemia burden globally, but this varies very much depending on the context and very much depending on the burden of infection within certain regions in the world. 
Um, one important thing is ma many people think of anemia immediately think of iron deficiency, but that's basically not the only cause. And so what I'd like to uh, just highlight that there's many other causes that are very important to consider too when we want to prevent anemia. One important cause is um, are the inherited red blood cell animal anomalies, which are about 15% of the global burden of anemia. And these include alpha and beta thalassemia, sickle cell disorders, and many other hemoglobinopathies. And um, since these are um, inherited, the burden very much depends on localization of where the carriers um, are, you know, uh, where the carriers live. But it is assumed that this burden will increase globally due to migration. Um, and so this is a burden that is cannot be prevented, but, but has to be treated in terms of anemia, uh, attributable risk of anemia. Then infections are a very important cause of anemia as well. Um, that they are very specific to the region and the geographical burden of infections. Important infections that lead to anemia are soil transmitted helminths, schistosomiasis, malaria, HIV, and tuberculosis, among many others. And then there are various other conditions that are um, related to mostly anemia of chronic disease, gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal disease, and kidney disorders. And it is assumed that about 13% of the global burden of anemia is due to those chronic diseases. And anemia in hospitalized patients is mostly caused by um, anemia of chronic disease. Of course, we're all aware that um, anemia is also related to gynecological and obstetric conditions, especially the regular blood loss due to menstruation puts women at increased risk of anemia, as well as adolescent girls. And then the pregnancy-related risk um, that can lead to iron deficiency because of the increased iron requirements during pregnancy, as well as potential blood loss during childbirth. So these are all the causes that can lead to anemia, but then there's a lot of risk factors that can increase the risk of anemia through multiple pathways. These include low socioeconomic status, like poor living conditions, uh, such as uh, poor water and sanitation hygiene, low food insecure or high food insecurity and poor dietary quality, as well as low attainment of education, which may limit the ability to understand or access the information provided on health, nutrition, and family planning. And then healthcare access and the use of healthcare services is certainly a risk factor, gender inequality, and cultural practices related to early marriage and very uh, frequent pregnancies. As part of the review paper, we have built onto a conceptual framework that was originally proposed by Chaparro and Sakdev, and um, we have basically made it more complicated we, than, than the original was, because we wanted to really show how very interconnected these causes and risk factors are. I'm not going to go into this, but if you are interested, please um, look at the, at the manuscript or at the review paper. So major causes in the knowledge of uh, anemia is that we don't have a lot of information on anemia by itself. So there, um, there has been a recent paper by um, Stevens that was done for the World Health Organization that found about half a billion people, women are at risk of or have anemia and about 269 million children. But this information comes from about 430 uh, surveys, and there are 64 countries that have no information at all on anemia in, um, in the past 10, 20 years. And then we will know more, mostly um, about from an anemia burden from preschool children as well as women, but much less among men, school age children, and elder people. And so we don't really, we know a lot more about most vulnerable population groups, but we don't quite know whether there's more population groups that we should worry about as well. And then there's several technical concerns related to hemoglobin assessment. And there's an input paper that is being provided, uh, written by um, a group of experts on specifically on the hemoglobin assessment. But what is recommended that if at all possible, you could do to uh, concerns of capillary blood draw, that a venous blood sample would be ideal. And if that is not possible, then a pooled 
blood sample of capillary blood, not just one drop, but multiple drops combined, would be a more accurate hemoglobin assessment. Um, and then, of course, if we are interested in addressing risk factors and causes, we would need to know the attributal risk of these various causes and, and risk factors. And that for that, we need adequate information. But there's extensive information available, for example, in malaria among children and soil transmitted helminths, but not HIV in children or we don't know much about uh, red blood cell disorders, for example, and the, the actual prevalence of that in, in populations. So we, we have um, a various data sets that have some information, but because they, they may vary by the sources, that they're not always linked together. And so we don't have all the information together, as well as there's substantial data gaps. So moving forward, we should improve the use of existing data because understanding the geology of anemia is important to design effective and targeted programs at the country level. And because cross-sectional surveys do not always allow, causal, do not allow causal attribution, data analysis across multiple data sources is recommended. And not many countries have more than three surveys, for example. So attributing the risks and the causes to the various, um, to the anemia burden is, is therefore much more challenging. So we also very much promote the sharing of de-identified individual data across surveys and, uh, and also consider sharing stored biospecimen for additional analysis of biomarkers that may leverage existing data. In the ideal, ideally, we would have a public data repository of de-identified data so that we could um, promote collaboration and sharing of data and make much more use of the existing data that has been um, collected under, under a lot of, with a lot of effort. I also believe that we should um, use existing data to show that the identity identify the actual data gaps. So sometimes um, I feel like we're modeling and show what there, what we know and less of what we don't know. So I think that could be more done in helping us guide where we should collect new data. So we, we will promote that countries with the potentially high burden of anemia or limited information on the etiology. Also, those countries who have no information about their anemia burden should collect should be considered for collection of new data. Any new planned survey, which is a, a, a large effort and requires a lot of resources, should consider the context specific um, potential risks and causes so that specific indicators could be added to that survey and thus let, shed some light on the various causes. The type of the blood collection and the analytical method is a key consideration that um, the survey implementer should consider. And if at all possible and, and resources allow, it would be very interesting to extend the anemia assessment to other population groups, especially younger adult adolescents and older people that we don't have much information from. Lastly, monitoring the evaluation of countries that prevent they have prevention programs should, um, should definitely continue and should be considered as part of um, the anemia uh, prevention uh, uh, program and agenda. So in summary, anemia is a consequence of a wide range of causes and biological, socioeconomic and ecological risk factors, which often occur simultaneously. Understanding the causes and risk factors of anemia for different population groups in a country is essential for the design and implementation of effective interventions to prevent and treat anemia. And a coordinated approach is required across various expert groups and programs to make the best use of existing data and to advocate for the collection of new data and relevant data, especially in countries with a high burden and limited information on the etiology of anemia. I would like to thank all the collaborators of that review paper who have contributed their expertise, as well as the funding by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I'd like to thank you. And here are two papers that I would like to highlight as relevant for this presentation. With that, I'd like to hand over to my colleagues. Uh, we are pleased to share some of our latest findings and guidance on how to adjust micronutrient biomarkers for inflammation using the Brinda method to understand some of the uh, driving factors of anemia 
that were mentioned in the prior talk and deficiency across different settings. And we're pleased to share some of our new tools for simplifying and streamlining analysis. So the biomarkers reflecting inflammation and nutritional determinants of anemia or BRINDA project is a multi-institution partnership, including investigators from many universities, government sectors, NGOs, as well as country representative involvement. Our overarching project goal is to improve global estimates of micronutrient status by pooling together existing nutrition surveys from across different target uh, population groups for secondary analysis. With again, this overarching goal to improve the interpretation of micronutrient biomarkers in settings of inflammation. So why do we care about the effects of inflammation on micronutrient biomarkers? Well, at the individual level, this can lead to an incorrect diagnosis. At a population level, it can complicate the interpretation of country prevalence surveys where the prevalence of micronutrient deficiencies can be over or underestimated, which can impact um, the perceived etiology of anemia. And also, in addition, it, it interferes with our ability to accurately assess the impact of evaluations. And you may actually make the wrong conclusions if the results really had nothing to do with a micronutrient intervention, but perhaps the burden of inflammation change in the population group. So our research to date with the Brenda Project has focused on preschool-age children and women of reproductive age. We're now expanding that to school-age, adolescent, and pregnant women. Um, but we've published separate findings and recommendations for how to address those micronutrient biomarkers for inflammation. And we've published this separately by different bio, uh, micronutrient biomarkers, and target group as the guidance can vary by, by these factors. Uh, however, we recognize that referring to multiple publications and varying guidance can complicate the, the proper use of this approach. Uh, thus, we, our team has really prioritized uh, simplifying and streamlining our approach to make this more user-friendly. I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Hanchi, who has been leading these efforts to describe um, some of this further. Thank you. So during the early stage of Brenda, user face a steep learning curve to apply the Brenda inflammation adjustments method. They need to read through multiple academic paper to understand the method. And then they either need to um, construct their own Brenda adjustment code or modify existing sample code to work with their specific data set. It was a complex process. We know this challenge and we took steps to streamline the process. So you can see over here, at the beginning, we share the sample code, and now we develop two valuable tools. One is a Brenda R package, the other is a SAS macro, and they're associate papers. So the Brenda inflammation adjustment R package and SAS macro are user-friendly all-in-one statistical analysis software. It can apply the Brenda inflammation adjustment to uh, retinal binding protein, serum retinol, ferritin, STFR, and zinc. Why is appropriate using AGP or CRP for various uh, population? And then this paper is published at Journal of Nutrition under the Nutritional Mathematics uh, and Modeling session. And you can see the DOI over here. So the R package is separately published at um, the Korean, the Comprehensive R Archive Network, and it has already passed a total of 4,682 downloads. In addition, the SAS macro led by our statistician Jia Xi Geng now is available at the Open Science Frame. So you can see we provide the link over here. Our goal extends beyond just publishing the package to have more citation, more reference. We aim to provide a robust training program to aid the utilization. To this end, we have made comprehensive training package available on the Brenda website. Let's use SAS macro as an example. So you can see it's over here, that's the interface. For each sample code, we have three components. The sample code itself, corresponding sample data and the, uh, the SAS macro. So to further facilitate the user-friendly use, uh, user, uh, use, uh, usage of the package, we have also provided a citation over here. And also we prepared a YouTube 
YouTube video. In this YouTube video, it's very short. It's 10 minutes. And it's also have transcribed all the, the lines. You can see the, the, the script over here. So this will allow user to follow each step to synchronize the YouTube guide and sample code. So aim here will just to make the Brenda approach more accessible and easy to apply. And we are proud to say we have achieved that. So at this time, the Brenda R package and SAS macro solely provide the Brenda adjusted value. This might be very limiting for so people who wish to analyze multiple biomarkers, compute the deficiency, and determine the geometric means of biomarker across various data set and various population group. To address this need, we have created the SAMBA, Statistical Operators for Micronutrients Biomarker Analysis. This tool is capable of simultaneously analyze, analyzing multiple micronutrient biomarker from several countries. Take into account the, the complex curve design, additional SAMBA apply the Brenda inflammation adjustment and calculate all the statistical parameters that you always use, mean geometric mean percentile and prevalence of deficiency. So how does SAMBA, code, SAMBA work? So SAMBA can calculate the micronutrient deficiency with Excel input. You input your survey information into Excel and five line of R code over here. And then it can generate the summary statistic while provide the Brenda adjusted value. And this paper is just accepted by Journal of Nutrition. You can read the pre-proofread pre -proof read over here. And I also I provide the DOI over here. So some people may like experience with R. We cannot develop packages for each statistic software. We cannot develop packages for Stata, SPSS, all the software. They will not be a wise use of time. We need to develop an app. This app will enable user to conduct micronutrient statistical analysis without needing to learn SAS or R, SPSS, SPSS programming language. So now I will take this time to demonstrate this R Shiny app. Okay. So I think now you can see my uh, screen. So in the screen, we have five steps on this R Shiny app. This app is on the website. If you have access to the website uh, internet, you can just open your computer and get access to this app. So we don't uh, supply a separate installation. So you can see we have five steps to do this app. The first is to import data. The second is to select your preferred biomarker, and then you can apply cutoff if there is one, and then the, we'll run the Brenda adjustment method and provide a report. I just want to say we are still testing and developing this app. So this is just a trial beta version. So the first thing is to import data. So let me open it. So I want to see where do I put the data. So I put on my uh, desktop and it's a SAS data. Uh, you, in this app, you can put any formal data, SAS data, SPSS, uh, Excel, and CV, uh, CVS. So this is a SAS data. I open it, I import this data. And you can see this data has been successfully Im imported. It has 12, around 12,000 observation of 17 variables. And you can see we have ID, age of month, different biomarker, and survey weight. So I said, yes, this is the data I want. And you can also view it in different format. So I said, okay, I want to import my data. My data has been successfully Im Im imported. And you can see over here, there's a next button and you press next, they will go to the next step. Sorry, for some reason, this one is, uh, is a little bit, okay, next over here. Okay, so now let's go to the second step is to select biomarker. So to tell the app which variables is which biomarker. So over here is serum ferritin, this is my biomarker. And I also need to tell them the union of this biomarker. Otherwise the deficiency calculation will be very different. Okay, this is STFR and this is a serum retinol. And this is my union. Retinol binding protein is RBP. And this is my union, and this is zinc. Also, this is my union over here, and the AGP and CRP. 
So zinc cutoff varies by the fasting status and then the time of the blood draw. In this trial version, we set the whole data set as one status. The whole, uh, whole data set need to have the same fasting status and the same time of the blood draw. But we are modifying this app to allow the individual status of fasting and the time of the blood draw. So, so stay tuned, this section will be changed. So then you tell them what's the population that you use. So population will be women of reproductive age. You see in my data set and click set biomarker. So biomarker is all set. And then the next step is to go to the next step. Okay, the next step will be the apply the cutoff. If you want them to calculate deficiency, you need to apply the cutoff. Because I indicate my population is a women of reproductive age, so the suggested cutoff is women of reproductive age instead of preschool age children. So I can just uh, apply this, this set cutoff as what uh, recommended value. Click set cutoff and my cutoff is set uh, correctly. Then click next. So then this is my data. So in the apply the Brenda adjustment method, you have two options. You, if you can only want the adjusted value, like there is a Brenda, then there will be an adjusted value. Or you also want the intermediate parameter. Brenda use regression, regression adjustment. Do you want regression coefficient? For me, I want all this value. So I click apply the Brenda adjustment value. And they said, okay, Brenda adjustment value was applied successfully. And you can see at the end of the new data set, they have all the uh, additional information on the intermediate parameter, as well as the adjusted value of all this biomarker. So it's underscore AJ, ADJ is adjusted value. And in this interface, you can also download a few of the bars that we have. So this is a bar plot. You can see what the geometric mean of all the biomarker that you input, What's the deficiency plot, the prevalence of deficiency, does it change before adjustment or after adjustment? And what's the uh, density plot look like? It look like the ferritin value shift to the left after the adjustment, uh, and the same as STFR. And there's no change for retinol because it's women of reproductive age is now recommended to adjust for retinol and retinol by, by mean protein. At this time, you can also just download the Brenda adjustment data, which is your data set plus the Brenda adjustment value and for secondary analysis uh, for your sake. Or you can go to the next one. The next one will ask you to generate a report. I will generate a report of HTML, give me a really good report. So I click here, generate report, said, okay, the Brenda adjustment report was generated successfully. Okay. And you can see over here that I have a new HTML file. That's my report. And you can see this is um, interactive report with a different section. So you can see what is that. First, we give you a breakdown of all the data. What is the original mean, median, um, a, a maximum value? And then before adjustment, what's the cutoff we use? And what's the prevalence of deficiency? And we also give you the bar plot for visualization. In the analysis, we just indicate this is women of reproductive age. So it's provide us what the AGP and CRP value, reference value that we use for brain adjustment. And we can see all the figures that in the app was demonstrated over here. You can see what's the change of geometric mean, what's the change of uh, deficiency based on the brain adjustment. So, and we also give you both tables and figures you can use for your report. So currently the app is only provide calculation for simple studies. So, but in the future, we would like to add feature of complex survey design. So this is the app. And as a progress of this app, uh, we're going to do internal testing of this app uh, this month and next month. So in August, we, are, we would like to integrate the Brenda R Shiny app into the Brenda website, and we welcome feedback. We invite you to all test this app on our website and welcome for your feedback. So now I will pass this uh, presentation to my good uh, colleague, 
uh, Dr. Ian Kong. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for um, the introduction, Hanchi. And uh, um, for the, you know, the next, the last uh, few minutes, I would like to introduce and um, this concept of uh, population and tributal fraction. And um, this can be used as a tool in anemia research. So um, in this brief presentation, I'll talk about the definition and also the interpretation, as well as the applications in um, one study in Malawi. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, thanks um, for the Brenda project for providing me with the opportunity to work on um, the uh, analysis and the studies looking at um, you know, uh, multiple micronutrient deficiencies and how they contribute to anemia. Um, but the problem that we have um, right now is that how do we quantify the impact of risk factors on anemia burden? Um, so um, looking at other research, we found that uh, population attributal fraction um, can be served as a useful measure. Um, it can be used to quantify and determine how important a risk factor is and how that contributes to uh, anemia. So um, what is um, PAF? population attributable fraction. So population attributable fraction estimates a proportion of disease burden in a population that can be attribute, attributed to a specific risk factor. Um, so most often people ask these questions. They ask what proportion of the risk of anemia in a given population is attributable to a risk factor. Or um, they can ask this um, another question what proportion of anemia risk could be eliminated if the exposure were um, eliminated while um, nothing else has changed. So um, we wanted, so based on these questions, we wanted to be able to quantify um, the contribution of this ex uh, specific exposure. It can be iron deficiency, can be anything and how, <clears throat> the effect, um, how it impacts anemia. So this PAF is defined as the difference between the risk in the whole population, <coughs> sorry, and the risk in the unexposed group, and then use the difference to divide by the risk in the whole population. <clears throat> the components of PAF include um, the prevalence of exposure, and also the relative risk. There are a few key assumptions. Number one, the risk factor is causal. Because um, by the definition attributable, um, this has a causal interpretation. So when we define the risk factor, um, most often we define um, risk factor based on our prior knowledge and evidence. So it cannot be anything, you know, any factor. It has to be, you know, something that has this causal uh, uh, association with anemia. Number two, um, the study design is appropriate to address the question. Um, the ideal scenario is that um, we have a like a cohort study, and then um, we have a lifetime follow up. Um, of exposed and non-exposed cohorts. A lot of times cohort study is very expensive and it is you know, very hard to um, retain uh, such group of people. So um, a lot of times we see in the literature, um, um, most you know, cross-sectional survey design is most commonly used, but just, very, um, just keep in mind that this is a, you know, that is going to be a limitation um, um, to this um, study design. And then we'll talk about it more later. Number three, there is an effective and efficient in, uh, intervention that can eliminate the exposure. So these are the three key assumptions when we wanted to utilize PAF in the research. Um, I'm going to talk about one study that uh, applies PAF in anemia research. So um, in the study published in um, 2021, uh, the researchers looked at um, the adjusted PAF 
that means that when they do the when they did the analysis, they also um, adjust adjusted for a bunch of different covariates that might affect the estimation of the relative risk. So they look at this specific infection, and the analysis was done by age group and season. So in the figure on the slide, you can see that there's uh, a dry season result and there's a rainy season result. Um, they looked at um, younger children under five years, as well as school age children. And the y-axis indicates the percentage of uh, PAF. So the higher the PAF, um, the more um, this um, infection, you know, the, uh, the greater the effect of infection on anemia. So um, if we compare the younger children and the school age children, you can see that the contribution of this infection to anemia is greater in the school age children than in the younger children. And also if we compare the dry season, versus the rainy season, you'll see that the difference is greater during the rainy season. So um, these are the common interpretations of PAF. Um, number one, people when people talked about the results, they look at partitioning of causality. For example, um, they asked this question, what proportion of the risk of anemia in a population is attributable to a risk factor? So based on the previous figure, then we can say the proportion of risk um, of anemia in, for example, school age children is attributable to the specific infection. Um, the other um, interpretation is that we can talk about the proportion of a preventive um, disease. So we can say uh, what proportion of anemia risk can be eliminated if the exposure were eliminated. But bear in mind that this question is only available if uh, there is an intervention or multiple interventions that are, that are available to eliminate the exposure. Um, in other words, if there is no intervention that's available to eliminate the exposure, then there's no point of talking about the population or total fraction. So um, um, there are, um, you know, we talked about the interpretations, uh, but we need to be careful when we actually talked about, you know, the risk factor, because um, a lot of times we need to first define the risk factor and then do the analysis. So uh, please know that the magnitude of the PIF actually depends on how the exposure is defined. For example, if we use different threshold for iron deficiency, right, then the PIF calculation will be different and the results would be different. So it all depends on how the exposure is defined. And just know that this is this plays a critical role um, when we calculate PAF. And um, we also know that anemia is quite complex. It can be caused by more than, more than one mechanism, right? So um, for example, inflammation, micronutrient deficiencies, socioeconomic status, et cetera, et cetera these can all you know, contribute to anemia. And when we talked about PAF, a lot of times these risk factors is not just like, you know, X to Y. Sometimes, um, you know, iron deficiency is caused by multiple factors as well. So this is a complex, you know, the mechanism can be quite complicated. Um, also, it is possible that two populations have the same PAF. It's just that based on the calculation, they happen to have uh, happen to have the same PAF values, but if in one population the incidence of anemia is lower, then um, even if they have the same PAF value, then the impact is much lower than the other population. So uh, based on this, um, this um, tells us that we need to consider both the PAF and the actual disease burden, not just looking at the PAF values. Um, when we wanted to talk about, you know, compare intervention benefits in different populations, or if we want to compare intervention in different disease outcomes, we definitely need to also take the actual disease burden into account, in addition to um, looking at the PAF values. Um, so 
um, the a high value of PAF for risk factor does not mean that others are not important. Um, if we see a really high PAF, then it suggests that uh, removing or reducing this exposure has a potentially high impact on lowering disease burden, for example, anemia burden. Um, but it also depends on how far the exposure is modifiable through timely interventions. So if the intervention um, plan text takes a long time, for example, several decades, sometimes a lot of things has, you know, will change over time, then um, that PAF may not be meaningful. So um, it all depends on, uh, you know, a timely intervention strategy is available, then um, the PAF calculation will be more meaningful. In conclusion, PAF can be a useful tool in the NIA research to estimate the proportion of disease burden attributable to specific risk factors. It can help us understand the potential impact of interventions and also guide uh, public health uh, policy making and resource allocation. Um, in summary, when we use PAF, we need to know the assumptions and the interpretations. For example, first of all, we need to define the exposure. And then if it's, it makes sense, then we proceed with the calculation of PAF. At the same time, we also need to think about the mechanism and whether there's any intervention that's available and that can reduce or eliminate the exposure. Um, when we design the study, we also need to um, think about what variables to collect and the quality of the data, whether they're appropriate to address the question. Finally, when we interpret the PAF values, we need to bear in mind that you know, the disease um, prevalence is also important, the exposure prevalence, and also the relative risk, you know, meaning that the association between the exposure and the disease, all of those are important when we interpret the <clears throat> when we interpret the PAF values or compare the PAF values. All right, here are um, here is a list of the references, and then Megan also um, already provided um, the key references in the chat. Thanks for uh, your attention and um, welcome any questions. Great. So thank you to all of our presenters. I really like to thank everyone for you know staying at the end of the day during the conference and for everyone who joined online. Um, we really appreciate you being here um, and the organizers for everything that they've done to pull off a hybrid and in-person event. Um, and so thank you all so much. And if you would like to get in touch, feel free to reach out to any one of us and we'd be happy to answer any follow-up questions in the future.